Welcome back to Face the Nation. We want to continue now with former FDA Commissioner and Pfizer board member, Dr. Scott Gottlieb. Dr. Gottlieb, we've been talking about uh, the baby formula shortage. Um, I want to ask you about COVID, but just to pick up on something you said, I, I think you told me there are only nine people who oversee the entire baby formula industry in this country? Nine? That's right. And I think there I think there were I believe there were three when I started at FDA. We got some more resources for that group. There's been more resources added since then, and there's a budget request from the current administration to add four more people. But yeah, only nine people right now oversee oversee the entire industry in the United States, and it was less than that just several years ago. That's astounding. Um, let me ask you about COVID. Uh, we hit this horrendous milestone this week of one million deaths over the entire course of this pandemic. Right now, we're averaging about 326 deaths a week. So we've, we've come a far way. But we heard from both Dr. Fauci and Dr. Walensky this week that they have started putting on masks when they go indoors once again. Um, there's concern about an uptick. What do you see in terms of trend lines? Where are we? Well, look, we're definitely seeing a surge of infection, particularly in the Northeast and parts of the Mid-Atlantic right now. If you look at the modeling going on in those states, states like Connecticut, New York, it does appear that the infections are peaking right now. And it's mostly a wave of infection driven by B2 and this new Omicron variant B2.121 that appears to be more uh, contagious and have more immune escape than prior variants of Omicron. It looks like most of the people who are getting infected aren't people who were previously infected with B1, but some portion of the 40 percent of people who escaped the prior wave of Omicron and are now getting caught by this current wave. I do believe that cases will continue to come down. Wastewater data uh, collected by cities does show overall cases coming down and that we shouldn't have a big wave of infection this summer. Although there are models floating around the administration, it does show a big wave of infection this summer. The bottom line is we didn't see that in 2020. We didn't see it in 2021 when B117 emerged in the spring. So the summer should be a backstop against continued spread of this variant, but it does pose a risk for the fall. And it's gonna be important to learn whether or not the new, newly formulated vaccines that are now in development will cover this B2 variant well. Hopefully they will, I believe they will, but that remains to be seen. But, so you re reject the idea of a summer surge, even though scientists like Dr. Burks, who was on this program just a few weeks ago, uh, is predicting and seeing a trend line that makes her very concerned that could happen because it's happened before. Yeah, and there is a model that the White House was briefed on last week that shows a big surge of infection in the summer driven by B2 as it moves into the Midwest and the West. I mean, it is certainly possible, but other people disagree with that model. Um, there is the potential that you see a slow burn through the summer. I think it's more likely that you're going to see infection levels come down. Remember, we thought that there was going to be a big surge last year in the summer with B117 when it emerged in the spring. And as we got into the later spring, infection levels came down. We had a relatively quiet June and July, and then Delta came along in late August and started to create a new wave of infection. I think that's probably the pattern we're going to see again, where June and July are relatively low. People do feel safe again. And then as we head into the late summer, probably yeah. B2.121 is going to emerge, or B2, mostly in the South. Dr. Gottlieb, we'll be watching that. Thank you for your insight, as always. Well, voters in five states head to the polls for midterm primary elections this Tuesday, and those contests will determine which party candidates will be on the ballot in November. But it is the contest among Republicans in Pennsylvania that is attracting a lot of attention. Our Robert Costa tells us why. Top Republicans are flocking to Pennsylvania in the final days of the state's red-hot Senate primary race, knowing the state will be a crucial battleground in this November's midterm election. Every Republican running for office says, I love Donald Trump. No, 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 I love Donald Trump even more. No, 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 I have Donald Trump tattooed on my rear end. <laughs> and the top three contenders are all pitching themselves as champions of Trump's political legacy. But voters face a conundrum. Who exactly fits the bill? Television personality Dr. Mehmet Oz won Trump's endorsement last month. But Oz has since struggled to fend off two challengers, retired hedge fund manager David McCormick, whose wife Dina Powell served in the Trump administration as a deputy national security advisor, and hard right candidate Kathy Barnett, whose fiery and deeply personal message on abortion has caught fire with grassroots conservatives. But it definitely made me become very adamant 
about the sanctity of life. Of but all. once polls in recent days showed Barnett jumping into the top tier, she also faced new and intense scrutiny of her past, including homophobic and anti-Muslim statements. Barnett is mostly denied and deflected, hoping to keep up her momentum. And on Saturday at what was billed as her final campaign rally, Barnett spoke to supporters in Bucks County alongside Doug Mastriano, who was endorsed hours earlier by Trump in the race for governor. Stand behind the cone, please. But CBS News and others were refused entry. No access, no questions allowed. They told us no press or the okay. Trump has been watching her rise carefully and warned his supporters to stick with Oz, arguing Barnett, if nominated, will, quote, never be able to win in November. And her rivals are sounding the alarm. You've called Kathy Barnett a mystery person. What do you mean by that? I call Kathy Barnett a mystery because every time she answers a question, she raises a bunch more questions. She's not transparent about so many aspects of her basic biography that we don't know who she is. Would Kathy Barnett be a risky bet for Republicans in November? Well, listen, um, I've gotten to know Kathy uh, on the campaign trail. I respect her, her story. Uh, but Kathy's been tested. She was tested in the last 24 months in a congressional seat, which she lost by 20 points. But the race remains a toss-up with voters divided. For Face the Nation, this is Robert Costa reporting from Philadelphia. We turn now to the war in Ukraine. Senior foreign, foreign correspondent Charlie Daggett has the latest on the diplomatic front and the battlefield. Charlie? Good morning, Margaret. The Ukrainian government is claiming a key victory in the battle for Kharkiv. And with Finland now on the verge of joining NATO, President Vladimir Putin faces the prospect of sharing an 800-mile border with a NATO partner. Finland today formalized its intention to apply for NATO membership with Sweden likely to follow suit in the days ahead. We have today a historic day. Finland will maximize its uh, security. President Putin has already warned the Finnish president he's made a mistake in joining the alliance. It comes as Russia has faced significant losses, pulling back from Ukraine's second largest city of Kharkiv. But the shelling continues. 67-year-old Vera Kosolopenko lost everything to a Russian missile. This was my home, she said. And yesterday, it was burned down. Russia has now turned its firepower on eastern Ukraine's industrial Donbass region, targeting infrastructure, bridges, oil refineries, warehouses. But standing here, looking at the size of this crater in the middle of a dirt road in a quiet residential neighborhood, it's hard to know exactly what the Russians were aiming for. The sheer devastation caused by an airstrike in Bakhmut that tore homes apart, leaving residents homeless and furious. We need help, a woman shouts in despair. Everything is destroyed, broken, salvaging what's left of their homes and their lives. British military intelligence reports that despite that kind of bombardment, Russia has failed to achieve substantial territorial gains in the past month. And it's likely Russia has lost around a third of the ground forces it committed to the invasion of Ukraine. Margaret? Charlie Daggett, thank you. We'll be right back. We want to return now to the economy and the financial challenges facing this country. We turn to the former CEO and current senior chairman of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein, who joins us from Watermill, New York. Good morning to you. Uh, good morning, Margaret. You know, Americans haven't experienced inflation like this in 40 years now. And the prices year over year are pretty incredible when you look at them. Gas up 44 percent, eggs 23 percent increase year over year. There's spillover into the services, too, now. I mean, you look at hotel prices, 23 percent increase, sure. airlines over 30. What does all of this indicate to you? Well, wages, well, I'll tell you how we got here. We had this massive exogenous event, COVID, lockdowns all around the world. And at the time that this was, uh, at this was beginning, 
it was a huge crisis. And I would say, you say, worse than 40 years, kind of unprecedented that everywhere in the world all locked down at the same time. In response, there was a massive uh, public policy um, response and um, to overwhelm it. And it was a little bit of fighting the last war in some ways because in the financial crisis, you recall, the feeling in the aftermath was it took a long time to recover from that. So this time we were going to go big and we went big and that created a lot of liquidity and all those dollars are, change, uh, are, chasing, um, are chasing assets. Mm -hmm. so, so we have too much growth, too much stimulus. Too much growth, too much stimulus. So, so you agree with the San Francisco Fed when, right. they, when they point to things like all the s fiscal spending uh, adding to inflation? Sure. Now, again, um, at the time, it was very uncertain. And the most important thing was to not, have it, was to not lose right. all those jobs and have a massive crisis. And so they reacted. And I think they reacted sensibly with what they knew at the time. Mm -hmm. And you can argue about that, but that's all with the benefit of hindsight. Right. Well, let's talk about what's happening now to try to control it. So it, it is the Federal sure. Res Reserve's job. You know this. But for our audience, you know, it's the central banker's sure. job to control inflation here. Chairman Powell said getting it down to 2 percent is going to involve some pain. What, what does that indicate to you? Um, and do you think the Fed is doing what is needed right now? Well, the object is, you know, there's, a, there's an imbalance, too much demand. And what you have to do is you have to slow down that demand. You have to slow down the economy. And so they're going to have to raise rates. They're going to have to curtail, hopefully, reduce the number of positions that are unopened because they, um, and increase the size of the labor force. And that's going to involve some pain. And the real pain is, not so, is partly what the Fed is going to do. But it's just that this inflation, some of it is sticky. It's going to be, you know, we have something like 8% inflation. Some of that is transitory. Some of that is transitory, will go away. You know, eventually the war in the Ukraine will be over. Some of the supply chain uh, shocks will go away. Um, but uh, some of it will be a little bit stickier and will be with us for a while. And while we're talking about this in the macro sense, overall, for individuals, and certainly the individuals at the bottom quartile of the, uh, of the, of the, of the pie sharing, it's going to be uh, quite uh, difficult and oppressive. Difficult and oppressive. I mean, you lived through uh, the last financial crisis. Sure. Goldman Sachs, uh, obviously, key part. You know it very well. When you say it took a long time, it took about 10 years to recover from the last financial yeah, that's crisis. Yeah, quite a long time. Yeah. So given what you're saying is unprecedented, what does recovery look like? Are you saying strap in for more than a decade of struggle well, here? It's... Well, no, no, it's a little bit different. There was a lot, a lot of different things going on, and there were, you know, it, it's, you know, it's always, it's always a, at least a little bit different. This is, this is kind of much different. And there you had the banks in trouble, a lot of distress, a lot of liquidity issues, big credit issues. Nobody was sure who was able to pay their, their, their debts as they arose. And that took, and, and then again, the financial system is the intermediary by which Fed accomplishes its activity. That's not impaired today. Actually, the consumer is starting out at a strong level. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, uh, it's going to be hard for uh, people to, to have savings, but they already have savings. They're not going to necessarily increase it quickly because of inflation, but they're starting in a much better place than we were then. Mm -hmm. And the Fed has very, again, powerful tools. Some of this will transition away. Some of the uh, supply chain issues, again, will go away. Ch um, China won't be locked down forever. Um, the war will not go, and the Ukraine will not go on forever. Some of the, and some of these things are a little bit stickier, like energy prices. And there are some elements of the supply chain that are going to be a lot stickier. I'll, I'll give you an example. We were the beneficiary for a very yeah. long time of the globalization of the economy, which made goods and services cheaper because we took advantage of cheap labor in countries. Right. Well, how good do we feel with what we've learned to be relying, and this was part of your last uh, talk uh, with, um, uh, with Secretary Buttigieg, how comfortable are we now to rely on those supply chains that are not within the borders of the United States yeah. that we can't control? Do we feel good about getting all our semiconductors from Taiwan, which is, again, an object of China? Do you think we're headed towards recession? Um, we're certainly heading, it's certainly a very, very high risk factor. And there's a, but I, you know, there's a path. It's a narrow path, but um, I, I think the Fed has very powerful tools. It's hard to finely tune them, and it's hard to see the effects of them quickly enough uh, to alter it. But 
uh, I think they are. Um, I think they're responding well. I think it's, it's, yeah. it's definitely a risk. If I were running a big company, I would be very prepared for it. If I was a consumer, I'd be prepared for it. But it's not baked in the cake. All right, Lloyd Blankfein, thank you for your insights. We'll be back in a moment. Former Secretary of Defense Mark Esper is out with a new book called A Sacred Oath, which chronicles his time in the Trump administration. Mr. Secretary, welcome back to Face the Nation. Margaret, great to be with you. I want to talk to you about a number of things, but you did say recently uh, that after the events of January 6th, which took place when you were out of office, that you now consider President Trump a threat to democracy. The committee that's investigating January 6th is about to begin public hearings, and they've said they have in their possess possession a draft executive order um, that would have had the then defense secretary seize voting machines and that the Department of Justice and the Pentagon uh, would then be involved somehow in stopping the transfer of power. Do you think it's important for that committee to lay out these facts to the public? Well, first, let me extend my condolences, by the way, to the families and friends of those tragically murdered yesterday in Buffalo. Uh, but to your question, yes, I think the January 6th committee needs to get to the bottom of the truth of what happened on January 6th, the events leading up to it, and understand it so we there is a degree of, kind of, uh, of accountability. And secondly, we have lessons learned to make sure it doesn't happen again. It's absolutely important. But it's, I mean, just even laying that out to you, it is kind of astounding to hear. Um, and in your book, you write General Milley actually had an agreement with the other uh, members of the Joint Chiefs, the, the lead military commanders in the country, to all resign if President Trump tried to use the military to stop the transfer of power. You write about personally being concerned that that's what he was trying to do. So you saw evidence or you had good reason to believe there was an attempt here to basically stage a coup? I had a lot of concern about what might or might not happen in the months leading up to the election, right? There was talk about conducting strikes against military strikes against against other countries. The president through the summer was talking about sending troops into uh, Seattle and Portland. And I write about in the final days, I have this private meeting with the head of the National Guard and General Milley, and I talk about what might or might not happen the day after the election, concerned that there may be the use of the military somehow to influence the outcome. And look, I, there's been a lot of criticism about why I didn't speak up. It's because I wanted to be there on the spot, if any of these things happened, to be the circuit breaker. Because the only two people in the United States that can deploy troops, U.S. military troops, are the president and the secretary of defense. And I was in that pivotal position to act if I thought something was, you know, mm -hmm. out outlandish, irresponsible, or would affect the institution of DOD or our country. That's, uh, that's what it came down to for me. So that's why you didn't resign. But why didn't you speak out as soon as you left office? I know you started writing the book within months, but yeah. why didn't you speak publicly about all of this? Well, the, the election was over. I think like many of us, I figured the president would, would challenge the election like others have done in the past. And after a few weeks, it would be over and we'd have a peaceful transition of power. But he did. There was an impeachment hearing about what happened with January sure. 6th and about whether there were attempts to stop the peaceful transfer of power. You're saying you actually were worried about that yourself. Well, I was concerned. You, you, you know, you always have to think through alternative scenarios, what might or might not happen. And I would have spoken out if, if called for to do it. I, I said on another network I would have cer certainly spoken out if he had won uh, the election, but he didn't. And at that point in time, uh, you know, I was patiently waiting to see what would happen, make sure that the, the peaceful transfer of power happened. As you know, I joined my other, uh, uh, the living secretaries of defense, wrote an op-ed on January 3rd, three days prior to the transition, uh, expressing our concern about the peaceful handover of power and warning the Pentagon, if you will, about the, the importance of them doing their duty. Um, you talk about and have spoken quite a lot this past week yeah. about the events in Lafayette Square. Right. Um, and it's an important bit of the public record. You were in the Oval Office with the president and he spoke about a very specific number, 10,000 of active duty troops potentially being sent into the streets of Washington, D.C. I want to play a clip for you here, because I asked the then Attorney General, Bill Barr, about exactly that. A senior administration official told our CBS's David Martin uh, that in a meeting at the White House on Monday morning, uh, the president demanded that 10,000 active duty troops be ordered into American streets. Is that accurate? No, that's completely false. That's completely false. Uh, 
Sunday night. The president did not demand that? No, he did not demand that. Why do you seem to have different recollections? I don't know. You know, I read about this in my book, that Bill Barr and I have different recollections. Of course, if you go through my story, you'll understand that the president calls over to the Pentagon earlier that morning and talks about 10,000 troops. That's when I'm first made aware of this request. And uh, look, I don't know why we have different recollections. I think in all these cases, people hear or see different things. But I, I'm 110 percent confident of what the president was seeking that morning. The former attorney general said it was completely false. Do you think that was an effort to deliberately mislead the public? I, I don't know. I, I, again, people have different recollections. Uh, people have asked me about things that I simply can't recall. All I know is the way we diffuse this is Bill Barr, to his credit, because he was a good partner on this stuff, put forward 5,000 law enforcement officers. And I put forward up to 5,000 National Guard to take care of this. I mean, do the math, 5,000 and 5,000. You're in trying my to mind, retrofit this 10,000 arbitrary well, number. Well, I'm yeah, I'm trying to kind of give him his 10,000 without giving him 10,000 active duty troops. And we pulled it off. And thank goodness it was, it was the way to kind of get that down, get out of the room and get on with what we needed to do. Are you concerned that if the former president stands for election, that he will surround himself with people who you're deeply critical of who uh, didn't try to short circuit. I mean, you were very critical, Robert O'Brien, the national security advisor. Uh, you write about the chief of staff, Mark Meadows. You talk about Stephen Miller, all people who were egging on some of these instincts. Yeah, absolutely he will. He figured this out in, in uh, 2020 after he beat impeachment. He talks about it. I describe this moment in the book where he thinks about the people he should put into office. And so, yes, that is a concern of mine if he runs and is reelected. Absolutely. But should any of those people have any proximity to public office right now? I don't think so, but that's my opinion. Well, there are names that we're watching and we will continue to cover. Mark Esper, a lot more in this book. It is worth reading. Thank you. We will be right back. Watch the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell tomorrow night for an exclusive interview with the president of the company that makes the Enfamil formula for babies. That's it for today. Thank you for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.